why does something stay um, with you for so many years? Why do the tracking shots and pads of glory yeah. stay with you? Um, uh, it's really uh, a person with a very strong, powerful uh, storytelling uh, ability, uh, uh, talent, genius, um, uh, who could create a solid rock image mm. that has conviction. Yeah. And that, that is the image. What's in that frame stays in that frame. What isn't in the frame is out. And that's it. You have to compose within that frame. I didn't know he was a still photographer before. And I said, of course, the still photography, once you get that image, but then it moves. Still cameras don't move, you know? And yeah. so it had this right. extraordinary authority saying, look, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the story this way and you're going to see it this way. Three Films on a Podcast has no claim of ownership on any film footage used in this episode. All film footage is owned in its entirety by the copyright holders and is used solely with the intent of film criticism, commentary, and education under fair use law. And just like every car in Too Fast, Too Furious, this podcast contains spoilers. Enjoy! Welcome back to Three Films in a Podcast. This is a show where three friends challenge each other to broaden their cinematic horizons, through a series of themed rounds. My name is Matt Weiler, coming to you from Pleasant Grove, Utah, and I am joined, as always, by Ben Lawhorn up in Salt Lake City. Hello. And even further north, Tyler Beck in Portland, Oregon. That's me. Hello, everybody. For those new to the show, welcome to our movie club. What began as a movie club among us three in a group chat has evolved into a, a little community that we share with all of you um, here on the internet um, that we're happy you are a part of. So whether you are stumbling upon us by accident or you know us, thank you for tuning in. And today we're excited to welcome with us um, a guest. His name's Travis from Let the Movie Speak podcast. Hi, how's it going, everybody? Great to be here. Travis, thank you for joining us today. Uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for having, having me on. Uh, Let the Movie Speak is a, a movie kind of review podcast where we take a decade at a time for each season we pick a round of movies and we ask some questions that hopefully are a little a little bit off the beaten path of your normal movie podcast instead of like how many stars or thumbs ups or thumbs down or whatever yeah it's like what is this thing saying and is it worth your time and maybe like how often would i rewatch this so it's a little bit of a different take hopefully and uh we've got a lot of uh stuff already up ready to listen to and a lot more coming awesome yeah i, I like that uh the uh is it worth your time and how like what's the rewatch scale yeah. i like those two metrics that's yeah. cool yeah, yeah we always great. end up at like some weird comparison with like schindler's list because it's like schindler's, <laughs> <laughs> schindler's this is a great movie but i'm not watching it once a year you know like, <laughs> yeah so it's an interesting question to that's ask. our that's our new that's like the the metric now like the schindler <laughs> the schindler yeah. line what side you're stealing on? that from you <laughs> that is now our segment it's all the <laughs> it's all now we'll share it <laughs> yeah yeah um great uh well we loved those answers um we're we're happy to have you in the clubhouse and without further ado We'll jump into the regular part of our episode. Um, and every time I'm hosting, I always ask the listeners to close their eyes for this part. Uh, hopefully they're not driving, but even if they are, <laughs> just close your eyes for a second. Come what may. And just, on cruise control. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you drive a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> the year is 1975 and you find yourself at the movies. And while you're tempted to check out The Man Who Would Be King or Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother... You're dying to see what Stanley Kubrick has up his sleeve after seeing A Clockwork Orange a few years back. We today are covering the 1975 multi-Oscar winner, Barry Lyndon. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, as I wasn't, we, we did this uh, Stanley Kubrick round. We're wrapping it up. And I had, to I had to scroll through his filmography to find either ones that I hadn't seen or ones that I, that I just felt like were you know, interesting enough to to pull off the shelf. Came around to Barry Lyndon. I saw that it had a high Rotten Tomato score. It, uh, yeah, like I said, won a bunch of Academy Awards. I did not see that it was three hours long. <laughs> <laughs> and the one detail you missed. The one detail I missed. And then Whoops. after viewing like the trailer, like gearing up for it, I knew immediately that this was going to be a very long experience. Um, 
And so uh, Travis actually posed this question before we jumped on here. Did any of us watch this in one city? Uh, kind of. I took multiple breaks throughout the day. Then I took like a two hour break to make dinner. So you saw in one calendar day. Yes. But not in one. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I did not. I, it's probably better than. I yeah, did, yeah. I, I made an hour and 15 and then I went the rest of it the next day. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a, a long haul, even for that second two thirds. I think I did about like about the same, like an hour and change, and then and then kind of parsed it out throughout the rest of the day today. If yeah. I'd known there'd been an intermission, maybe I would have like shot for that. But right. yeah, so anyone who hasn't watched it yet, you can get to the intermission and then take a break. Yeah, it's a great spot to end. Travis, had you seen this movie before? No, I've. It's always been on my list, but like you know, three hours and like lots of powdered wigs and. Tr- Tricorn hats and it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it bumps itself for a few reasons. Like sure. that, that's just a shallow, but it's true. Um, so no, I hadn't seen it before. I'd seen enough Kubrick to know that, you know, I should probably watch this, you know, but mm. I hadn't gotten around to it at this point. Yeah. Well, what was your overall impression of it? So I think like it's objectively pretty, you know, there's no question like Kubrick's not going to put something in a movie if it doesn't look kind of spotless you know the symmetry and the the the, obviously the his quest in this film to do everything by purely natural light with no no added light is insane like Mm -hmm. i mean like that's a that's a that's a death warrant that you're signing yourself (laughs) yeah and so like it's a feat like it it won what cinematography art direction and Mm -hmm. you know costume or something like that um yeah so art direction costume and music score yeah, those are all like very warranted. I feel like I don't know yeah. how you, I don't know how you beat the movie that didn't use any light bulbs and <laughs> look this good. Like it's just crazy. Story wise, you know, I think it has the same Kubrick uh, feel as a lot of his other things, where he like really centers on one person, and that person is not good. You know, not likable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think he cares. Kubrick Kubrick doesn't care if you like his protagonist. He's trying to make like clinical sharp pointed, you know, uh, narrative comments despite that. So I think he succeeds in that regard. Um, but because like, it's not my favorite aesthetic, it doesn't like look as spooky as the shining or make me laugh as much as 2001, uh, not 2001, um, strange love or Mm. like just blow your mind with, you know, space with 2001, a space odyssey. It's, 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 it's definitely good. Like, I can't say it's not good, but it's a hard movie to love because it's so long. Um, it's kind of crackly dry at times. And there's, there's not a lot of people in there to latch on to, you know, character wise oh, for me, true. but, but it looks great. I mean, of course it looks great. Yeah. That <clears throat> essentially echoes all my sentiments. This is the first time I watched it as well. And in fact, I don't even know that I'd heard of it until it came up to do this episode and just on the name and just who the director is. I was like, Oh, it's probably some like, weird business movie like a wall street type movie like i <laughs> for some reason i pictured guys in business suits and like something to do with like i have i don't have no idea where i like glenn gary from. glenn ross sure yeah something along yeah, those lines you yeah. like you know more along the lines of like what he had done with the killing or i i honestly yeah. have yeah. no idea where i got that picture in my head from uh obviously that's not the case um <laughs> and you know like <sighs> I mean, my, as far as my overall thoughts, like I didn't love it, you know, but I didn't hate it. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever watch it again, but it was gorgeous. <laughs> like, like you said, it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, maybe one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen as far as just cinematography is concerned. Um, and you know, I respect it for all the achievements, uh, that it made as far as the filmmaking is concerned, um, going through the IMDb trivia they used a specially made 50 millimeter Zeiss lens oh, with yeah. an F.7 aperture, which is a fun little in joke for Ben and I. But that's like I can't yes. like I can't even believe how difficult it would have been to shoot that scene on that shallow of an of an ap- aperture. Like the depth of field is is literally nothing. Like it's hard right. enough to shoot a portrait with like an yeah. 85 millimeter lens all the way open, you know. Um, so there's a ton of stuff like that, that I really respect about it, but, uh, you know, like I'm, and I'm glad I watched it. I will say that, like, I think it's the purpose of this podcast and this 
exploration club is to make ourselves watch movies like this because there's about i don't know however many <clears throat> movies long kubrick's filmography is uh there is that many movies ahead of this one that i would watch again <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean <laughs> so i'm glad i saw it but you know it, it it was what it was i can respect it for what it was yeah for me to put it in the context of a long time running segment here on three films pod. It would not pass my Schindler list test. Um, I mean, we've established that from the beginning. Something Everyone knows what that is, but every other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I've heard <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. Like I will say, I want to watch it again now that I've seen it. Like, and I know what's coming just to see what else I could get out of it. But after that, I don't know that I have a huge desire. Like it, I think it's never a good sign when I finish a movie and my first thought is like, oh, cool. I'm just like one step closer to being a completionist on Kubrick's <laughs> yeah. films. Like only got two left. Like that's a weird way to look at a movie. Like, well, that's out of the way. Let's move on. So, but I mean, that, that kind of was it. Like, again, echo everything you guys said. It's beautiful. One thing I thought was really interesting, Travis, that you said that I hadn't thought about before is that, I mean, Kubrick so many times, like we don't love our protagonist, which is kind of crazy. And mm -hmm. we just talked about paths of glory last week. And I'm like, man, is that kind of the only time Kubrick's done like a morally good protagonist? Cause you know, we do the killing and you mm -hmm. know, they're doing the robbery. We've got the shining. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 2001, just all these other movies. I'm like, man, maybe I wonder if that's the only real time we've seen someone who like we can agree with, you know, but I don't know. That, that's interesting. I think it was a really good point that I just hadn't really considered before. And it, that is that does make a protagonist really interesting when you don't necessarily agree with everything that they do, but we're with them the whole time. So I don't know. I'm glad I watched it. I'll probably watch it one more time. But after that, like, I don't know that I would need to to see it again, but I guess I cross it off, you know, yeah. onto Lolita and Spartacus. <laughs> yep. How Which would you I'll oh. admit I didn't know Kubrick made Spartacus. I had no idea until How literally did. today when I was looking through IMDb. Have you seen Spartacus? No. Oh, okay. Spartacus is great. I haven't seen yeah, it in I really want a to. long time. It's three hours and 17 minutes. So strap in, fellas. Oh, man. <laughs> but I mean, it's got Kirk Douglas. So there you go. Yeah, that buys you at least 17 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so how, how, would, how would you guys explain this movie to someone and why should somebody watch it, Tyler? Oh, tough question for me. <laughs> 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 only because you know like i said i didn't really love the movie very much and it's not so much that i hated it uh but if someone were to ask me hey i don't know what kubrick movie to watch uh there's no way i would recommend this one unless it was like maybe if it was like my sweet grandmother or something you know i've got the like, perfect movie for you grandma this might be okay for her <laughs> it's a little more tame than the rest of his movies you know there's obviously some stuff in here but um you know I, and like like i on that note, it's my taste, you know, my tastes are not the same as everyone's. Um, so I guess it's to say why someone would watch it. Personally, I would just say just for the cinematography of it. Um, it's at least like an interesting story to the degree that I didn't turn it off. You know, like I at least kind of wanted to know what was going to happen. Um, but <clears throat> I don't know. If I, like all I could think of the whole time when I was watching this thing is like, I just wish this was Lord of the Rings. <laughs> You know, <laughs> if I'm going to watch someone go out on a quest and it's going to be three hours and it's going to be a cinematic achievement and it's going to be pretty, I uh, just for my money, just give me the Lord of the Rings. You know, I'll just watch that again. <laughs> but, for sure. Um, yeah, that's that's all I could really say about it. Just why <laughs> someone should watch it. It's pretty. Where are you, Ben? Um, if I had to explain this movie to someone, I would use the immortal words of Canadian poet Abby Graham. And say we started from the bottom, now we here. Because <laughs> I think that's basically just what the movie is. It's someone who like starts out with nothing and works his way up. So um, but it looks cool, you know, a lot of yeah. cool shots, a lot of like um reimagining actual paintings and stuff, which is awesome. So um, yeah, I don't know. Like like I mentioned last time too, I, I don't know how much I would recommend it unless I knew someone really loved like period pieces, that kind of yeah. a thing. If that was their jam, I'd recommend it. Or if like me and I just wanted to be a completionist with Kubrick, you know, like they just like, you know, knocking everything out from a director. Other than that, I don't know, you know, if, if someone said, Hey, what's a Kubrick I should watch? I mean, I might suggest the two I haven't seen before this one. Cause I'm like, I don't know, like Lolita's <laughs> probably okay. I, don't, I have no idea, but <laughs> Um, I would, yeah, I'd probably be in my, in my lower half for sure for Kubrick. So 
I don't know. But, but those are my thoughts on on this. What are you, Travis? Um, I would explain it uh, to a modern audience as Stanley Kubrick does Hamilton a little bit. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like that. There's a lot of parallels. Um, if you care for like looking for those things, the narrative structure, it's like the duel at the beginning, the duel at the end. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the whole like get up, right? The uh, the era and aesthetic of it looks the same. Uh, but it's like if you sucked all the fun and <laughs> fancy out of Hamilton and you just watched like a guy make mistake after mistake after mistake yeah. um, <clears throat> and just be, fall and, his way to the top. Y- yeah. And then back <laughs> down again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, yeah, um, it, 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 it's definitely for Kubrick completionists. I don't think it's for someone who's seen The Shining once and loved The Shining. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't that, follow that feels like this. That feels like a hard shift. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, if you like, if you like this period of drama, Kubrick does a great job with it. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it, it also has, you, you, you have to be okay with just that slow Kubrick march towards the end of this isn't going to end well, like this is not yeah. going to end well. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It just, it feels like every other Kubrick movie, which is a good thing because it's just, it, this is really his stamp, you know, like the movie ends and it's like dread from scene one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you get that in this movie, even though it's filtered through the lens of like beautiful oil painting compositions and characters that are speaking very properly and whatnot. And, you know, like even like the sex and the violence is like very in line with what makes sense for this, you know, novel, you know, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so like, if you like that stuff, that aesthetic and, and you also, I don't know what the Venn diagram is. You guys, people who love pride and prejudice and like, <laughs> uh, the Patriot by Mel Gibson. And, and like, <laughs> and they love Kubrick. I guess this is for them. Yeah. Whoever sure. yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah whatever that Venn diagram is a little That's, sliver. I don't I think the, I hated the Patriot. I only saw it once, but I don't, I don't know. I, 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 during that one? I think it was what I expected of it. Keith Ledger's in that. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Um, I mean, I forgot to mention, I was gonna say earlier that the first half of this might be like recency bias, but it reminded me of solo from us watching that where it's like mm. a guy who kind of just like works his way into whatever he can to get out of his current predicament. So if you want like a boring Han Solo movie or like a non action <laughs> Han Solo, like this is kind of it, you know, it's like, if oh, you I'm want your Chewbacca to be an effeminate gambler, <laughs> yeah, an exactly. effeminate can do that, Irish so. gambler pretending to be yeah. a Frenchman. Yes. Barry, Barry does shoot Greedo like halfway through. Yeah, that, yeah. that's true. He did shoot first. The recut yeah. left it. So I think it's the best thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just thought about that. It's like, oh, this is like, yeah, he's just like, uh, how can I get out of this jam? I'll join another jam. <laughs> you know, just like slowly working his way through. But yeah. Yeah, I would explain it similarly uh, with other others in that, I guess, unique genre of protagonists who have come from nothing and transcended class and like, become something like Les Miserables and Count of Monte Cristo only 20 or 30 times boring, more boring than those. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And like everyone's already said, if, if the story doesn't buy you in, you have to love that time era and art and film to really want to get through this based on uh, what we've seen from Kubrick. Now, <clears throat> what were some of the Kubrick isms uh, that you could pick out from this film, Ben? Um, I mean, I won't speak on it too much because I feel like you guys would probably speak on it better. But I, honestly, a lot of it just comes down to the shot composition. I think he's just get a, you get a wide, really wide establishing shot of whatever room they're in. And maybe a time when a, a different director would like cut closer to the conversation. We just stay back mm-hmm. and hang out and watch it. Um, and then the extreme of that is like the super close ups, you know, where, like we're right on these people's faces. So to me, I mean, I think it's just a Kubrick you know, that's his style. I think so. It's a really basic answer, but you know, I own uh, it. That's who I am. So <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I loved, I love his devotion to the projects that he, that he works on. Um, I mean, it didn't win, you know, Academy Awards for nothing. It, it, it got, you know, the costume, the music, the, his work on the lighting was just insane. Uh, like you said, like the long shots, the close ups. that, that, choking slash heart attack scene from sir charles linden at the table mm. like i was gasping for air yeah just watching it happen it's like anyone any filmmaker that can like make you feel those things like mm-hmm. is is doing like really awesome uh creating there um what about you tyler uh for me like i feel like with kubrick the thing i'm noticing 
is he has like a lot of patience in the way he tells his stories because everything builds sort of slowly. There's no big jumps into anything. It's just sort of like things are bubbling up. Things are happening. You can see where things are going. And then all of a sudden you're in it. It's not like you jump into the moment. It's just like, oh shit, we're here. And in this movie, the example I can think of is uh, <clears throat> the like the way that the 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 uh, the fight scene in the pr- piano recital when L- Barry just goes, oh, you man. know, bananas on his uh, s- his stepson. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because you know th- everything up to that point was so reserved, and you could feel a tension, obviously, in their relationship, the the, the relationship of those two men. Um, and you could feel the tension of like Barry's life slipping away, his, his wealth and his power and everything slipping away. And so it's just, he has such like a restraint on the way that he like pushes that forward. He pushes those, those themes and those tensions forward. And then all of a sudden you're in it and you're dealing with it. And then it's kind of over. And that's like, you know, it reminds me of the shining a lot. Like it's a slow build. He's not just like all of a sudden crazy. It's just, crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier yeah. and then he's dead in the hedge maze you know <laughs> like yeah so i for me that was probably and then um the unlikable protagonist that's something I've, I've picked up for sure and in this movie specifically because at least like in all the other kubrick movies i've seen <clears throat> the the protagonists are not good guys but for whatever reason they're their charisma and their charm you you like them for whatever mm. reason you can at least like you're okay hanging out with them you know you know to keep them arm's length but like you don't they don't they're not as off-putting as i felt uh our boy barry to be i just did not (laughs) i couldn't stand him i didn't like him the whole time i thought he was whiny and just i don't know he just bugged me so yeah you never wanted him to succeed yeah well it's not even that it's just like i don't know he just was a bummer to hang out with at least like (laughs) yeah at least in the shining like freaking jack's like fun to hang out with you know what i mean like yeah i throw a ball on a wall with him sure yeah <laughs> yeah but like barry oh, yeah. like get me out i would have like whatever i don't know i just didn't like him so uh oh, yeah you. the yeah. unlikable protagonist for sure is, is another another uh theme a kubrickism <laughs> what are you travis any kubrickisms we're missing um i don't want to brush over anything that's already been said but yeah like the the dread you know from scene one even though this isn't like i'm gonna get killed by some ethereal force like the shining or you know even in full metal jacket it's like the slow march towards war Mm. um i'm gonna die you know um this is the slow march towards the fall of someone you know so there there is Mm. that that style of pacing um Mm. that tyler was talking about is like Again, I get the feeling in the scene one of a Kubrick movie, this is not going to end well. And <laughs> that plays itself out in a lot of different ways, depending on the yeah. movie, but uh, it pretty much always ends there. A couple specific moments that, like, I think are just like nobody else could have done it this way is when you get that, like, really brief flashback to the sun on the horse when he falls off. Yeah. Um, it's just like perfectly shot and whatever, but the sound design there is terrifying. It's like, it's so short and the horse like whinnies but it's like extended and there's reverb and it's just like really jarring and then you're just like Mm -hmm. back to the kid um that that totally feels like something paced like something out of the shining it feels like something from a nightmare right like it feels like like a a nightmare flashback of totally someone that potentially saw it happen you know yeah or like almost the kid's memory of how traumatic it was in the moment or yeah something like that and then the other one is when the when you know spoiler alert for Barry Lyndon when the kid when the kid dies or like right before he dies, he Kubrick has this way of handling um, like death and with and lots of things right like this is mm-hmm. what Stephen King's criticism of his adaptation of The Shining was like it's cold and clinical it's not yeah. warm like the novel was and there's some truth to that like especially in in, in moments like I can't think of a director who another director who gets away with like a kid who's like father am i going to die <laughs> and the dad's like no you're not going to die you're lying to his dying kid and then yeah. like if i die am i going to go to heaven um of course you'll go to heaven and then s- almost smash cut as he's trying to like cheer his son up choking tears <laughs> through the story to the freaking coffin like, yeah just, boom, coffin with a kid in it and i was like wow like, i'm a 
I'm so glad you brought that up because so the first time I saw The Shining was for this podcast, you know, two weeks ago or whatever. And the whole time I, you know, I don't really know what happens, but I'm like, is, is Kubrick going to kill this little kid? Yeah. Like, is Kubrick the, the kind of guy that would kill an innocent little kid? And I was like, I think he might. I think yeah. he might. And then this movie answered him like, yeah, I was right. He would. That sadistic yeah. bastard. I know he didn't write the, mo- <laughs> the story, but, um, you know, it's just like, OK, yeah, Kubrick is the kind of guy that would kill this sweet. Little he could have changed it and saved him. He could have. Yeah. He did yeah. give that kid the 1700 version of Danny's haircut, though. Yeah. Just that, <laughs> yeah. that whole cut. Just it's the only one he knows. In the back. Was that yeah. like maybe Stanley was not allowed that haircut growing up? <laughs> maybe. Yeah, that's the one thing <laughs> so he's, he's like always living wanted. it out. <laughs> What would you say is your biggest takeaway from this movie? If, if we haven't already covered this, well, what, what's your favorite moment and what was your biggest takeaway uh, from this movie? And let's uh, let's let's start back right back with Travis. Sure. Um, I mean, other than the fact that it looks great, which we've covered in, in a few different ways, um, I'm looking for like story and theme. And we, we always ask on our show, what's it saying, you know, and mm-hmm. Kubrick never says nothing. You know, there's right. he's way too good of a filmmaker to just be like, this is literally just pretty, but there is nothing there. There's a lot there. It's just in a three hour powdered wig package that <laughs> yeah. might might not be your jam, right? Um, <laughs> so essentially, like, I my biggest takeaway from this movie is his his point of like depicting Barry as the absolute center of this universe is this is a story about like fathers and sons. You know what I mean? Like. He loses his father in the opening scene. He spends the entire movie um, making other men in his life who come in in various ways into paternal figures. You know, this general there, yeah. the Chevalier, um, um, all of these men like specifically refer to him as my boy, which is just yeah, a colloquialism, but, but it, it's also very specific. You know what I mean? Like Kubrick didn't do that by accident. So it's a story about fathers and sons and the loss thereof. And, and then we see Barry grow into a father who is like so broken and um, you know, he's a good father. They make a point to say he's a good father, but then Kubrick takes that from him. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Halfway. Fair enough. But then Kubrick takes that one thing, like the one thing in the movie that he has, that's real father, son, love companionship. He just yanks it away from him. And then, and then Barry's essentially like, I feel like resigned to die at the end. You know what I mean? When he, when he looks uh, Bullington, uh, Bullington um, in the eyes and he says like, yep, I'm ready for him to fire his first shot. It, it's Kubrick telling us, the viewer, like there, there is so much wrong with, uh, with, with this guy, you know, because of like, also it's like a, a, a nature versus nurture thing. And I feel like Kubrick, you know, is not afraid to go there psychologically. Um, mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's like my biggest takeaway is like, it's about fathers and sons. It ends the same way it started with him leaving like getting in a carriage and going off to some new destination as just a broken man without a father. And that's not, it's, it's not like super fun. Uh, yeah. uh, but that's what it is, you know? Yeah. That's um, I never thought of it. It was in the lens of a story about fathers and sons. Um, it's an interesting take. And I, I think I agree with you. I, I had more taken it more as just like uh, an opportunist and sort of like, <clears throat> you know, a story about karma, right? You know, here's like this guy, you know, he just took every opportunity that he could, whether it was like good, you know, quote, good or bad. Um, And he got essentially what he deserved in the end. And then, you know, there's also the commentary on like, you know, class struggles and and class divides and whether it's fair that he deserved what he got in his station, like, you know, there's, there's all that sort of stuff around it. And I, and I think it's interesting the take you got from the duel at the end, because I didn't take it as so much as he was ready to die. I thought he took it as like he had resigned himself to the fact that this was his fate and mm-hmm. almost like almost like, you know, despite his best efforts, he couldn't outrun. He couldn't outrun his fate or his karma, right? Like. He got everything he wanted, but there was this one little thing that came along in the package deal that was this stepson that hates him that ends up killing him in the end. And I think he just was kind of like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I thought I took it more as resignation than acceptance. But it's you know, that's one of the best things about cinema and, you know, art and, you know, stories like this is you can, you know, there's a there's an argument to be made either way. 
No, but I think my favorite part was just I loved uh, the chivalry of all the conflict, you know, like even the yeah. fist fight in the in the army, you know, they form a square and there's rules and whatever. And then the duels they take. Speaking again about the patience of Kubrick, like the 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 slow rollout of these duels and just like how long it takes them to load their pistols, <laughs> and how long it takes them to aim. And are you ready? And all these rules and all this like decorum. Uh, and then you juxtapose that with the like violent outburst that I mentioned at the piano recital. And because every other scene of violence we see has these like rules and this like, you know, the, the, the chivalry of it all uh, that that fist fight in the recital just was like shocking and striking. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, like you it's like gnarly, yeah. you feel as like aghast as the people in that recital do. And uh, to me, that was my favorite part of the movie. I, you know, it's a shame that uh, a, a scene of domestic violence and abuse uh, <laughs> is my favorite part of this movie. But uh, just the way that it was crafted and the way that we're set up to react that way, I thought was, was you know, pretty brilliant stuff from our, our guy Stanley. When he comes like when those doors open. <laughs> and he starts walking. I was like, "Oh fuck!" He's yeah. just like, "Like I'm gonna go fuck with this guy right now in front of everybody." Yeah. <laughs> he's gonna watch this. Like, oh, this is pretty cool. The <laughs> fact that he's dragged his son into the prank, like his his biological mm-hmm. son, makes it worse because it's like, oh, you had him put the clopping shoes on. Yes. Don't you think he fits my shoes very well, your ladyship? Almost to shield yourself or make it worse or something. It's just, yeah, it is yeah, bad. Yeah. Like, and I, th- I feel like he, out. yeah, he must like convince the kid, like, let's go have fun. Let's play yeah. a game. You know, daddy will he love know it. He's a total just like pawn in this like <laughs> yeah. thing that he's doing against his dad. Well, but. and that kid's the, you know, that kid is, he gets everything he wants. He, in his eyes, he's supposed to be the center of attention. So he's like, yeah, yeah I'll put the shoes on and make some yeah. noise. Like, sure, dad's not going to do anything to me. <laughs> and he doesn't. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's been mentioned already. My favorite part that I put down was the duel, like just the way, mm. like we talked about, like all the minutia, like everything that happens, which to me also just makes it so much more shocking and funny when the gun just fires, right? When he cocks <laughs> it, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. I wasn't ready for this. Holy shit. And they're like, oh, rules are rules. You fired it. So it's his turn. I'm like, oh my God, you know, and then speaking of the anti Hamilton, you know, Lyndon does throw away his shot. And I'm just like, all right, well, what's going to happen now? Like, what is he wanting out of this? Like, is he wanting Lord Bullington to be like, all right, I'm satisfied. I'll leave. You can say whatever, you know? So, but when he slowly starts shaking his head, it's like, Oh my God, he's going to shoot him. <laughs> like he wants to go again. This is, this is crazy to me. And, you know, brief shout out to screen drafts. Cause I now finally understand the Lord Bullington rule, how you can't <laughs> like answer twice until someone else answers. So I get that now. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I mean, and just briefly, like to tap into my personal stuff, you know, we talked about Hitchcock and how great he is at editing. I am to be trivia says that this scene took 42 mm. days to edit, which blows my I mind. I can't oh even imagine. Gosh. That's crazy to me. I mean, if you think about all the takes that he probably did, you know, obviously there's like a ton to go through. But I'm like, man, if I had to spend a month and a half on just one scene of a movie, that would just drive me insane but whatever they did worked like i think it was it was wonderful so um i think yeah kind of obscure but what i took away from this is like well this is marty scorsese's favorite kubrick movie i saw that i why like i don't like and, and not like a judgmental thing but that's almost more like why i want to rewatch it. it's like what what do i what am i missing here you know because again like we watched the apu trilogy because of Martin Scorsese. Mm-hmm. And I loved that. That that was great. Like I I feel like I got it. You know, it's like, okay, I understand why this is really good. But when I watch this, I'm like, I get the the behind the scenes stuff, the score, the cinematography. I understand all that. But I'm like, man, I could I just don't know like on what you know level this becomes my favorite Kubrick movie. Like, well, I don't know. I don't know what I would have to um see in it. You know, and like we talked about it, Tyler with Lebowski, like the first time you watch it, it's like I don't know if I got it exactly, yeah. you know, but now it's like, oh, this is like one of the funniest movies of all time. I don't think I don't think Barry Lyndon is like in that category, but we it's don't like, know yet. That's true. I don't know. That's why I just wonder, like, maybe there is something I could get out of a rewatch where like now I know what's going to happen and I can focus more on how it's happening. You know, I think that's one of the good things that we get out of a rewatch. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you compared this to the Apu trilogy, because I think it's a very good 
comparison. You know, the Apu trilogy can be a tough watch for some people. It's in black mm-hmm. and white, but it is uh, very beautifully shot. And we, and we talked about it at length on our episode. Um, but like, you know, the characters there are all likable. There's way less happens in the Apu trilogy, like way less. <laughs> <Yeah>. Very slow. <laughs> and it's it's it's, you know, it moves at a glacial pace. But I didn't I watched it all each movie. I watched it in a full sitting. Whereas this and they're I mean, they were long. They're two hours long. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would say the big difference between this movie and the Big Lebowski as far as um, a second watch is I wanted to watch the Big Lebowski a second time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I get that. Like when I when I paused it yesterday because um, we were getting up to do something. Yeah, she's like, you don't have to pause. It. I was like, I, don't, I think I want to actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm OK pausing yeah. right now. I think I need to step away from this. Like, I don't hate it, but I'm just like. I don't know. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. Like, I, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, as many of you know, we like to uh, do something of a exercise where we, we select four choices for a Rushmore mountain. I don't know if we want to do a period piece Rushmore, a lover boy Rushmore. <laughs> um, I, I thought of the lover boy idea at the beginning of this movie. He wasn't so much of a lover boy by the <laughs> end of this movie. Um, but I think period piece would be yeah kind of cool. I'm happy to go first if uh, yeah, please people do. need I'm, to build their list or I'm whatever. I'm still making my list right now. <laughs> These are OR scrubs. Oh, are they? <laughs> this is unexpected, as like we've discussed on here. I'm I'm not pro crow at all, but I, I am gonna put going to put American Gangster on here. Because wow. I think it's it's a good period piece movie. It made me feel like it was shot back then. And, you know, I mean, Denzel could do them wrong. We've already talked about him quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So I think American Gangster would make mine. Um, I love Atonement. Um, if, you know, for nothing else other than that one or, you know, that long, like I think it's like 10 or 11 minute take, you know, through the actually the beach of Dunkirk. So that's kind of cool. Um, James McAvoy, Saoirse Ronan and... Is it Kieran Knightley? I forget who else is in that, but it's a really good movie. I know it sounds like I love it, but it's really good. So you should check that out. <laughs> um, a little tease into our next round, but a legitimate answer is Lincoln. Um, Cause I kind of felt like, you know, I'm watching that. I was like, man, did Spielberg get like a time machine and go back and just like film all this? Cause this is like crazy. Like it was, I don't know. I thought he did a, a great job with that. Um, and then kind of going back and forth between a couple, but I want to just throw out the favorite. Um, I think that was a, a great movie. Did you just look at me? Did you? Look at me. Look at me. How dare you? Close your eyes. Just from a couple of years ago with Olivia Coleman and uh, Emma. I, I can't think of her name. Stone. Now. What's up? Emma Stone. Yeah, Emma Stone. Thank you. I was talking about Emma Watson earlier with the 15 minutes of Marvel guys. It's like, that's not her, but um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that movie is, is really good. So I highly recommend that if you haven't seen the favorite, Um, but yeah, so those would be my four American gangster atonement, Lincoln and the favorite. Fantastic. Uh, Travis, do you have four ready to go? Cause I do not. I'm glitching. I feel like a little bit. I can hear things now. Cool. Hello. (laughs) <laughs> okay um oh gosh i'm flying by the absolute seat of my pants here um i'll i'll stick with true grit for my western Ooh, nice. um that's Great. just i'll i'll stay with that one um i was thinking about a scorsese and like i mean raging bull because of its like you know perfect like use of black and white and everything i feel mm-hmm. like is is pretty <laughs> solid um i'm supposed to have four right uh what else is good um period piece it's hard because some of the old movies i like that are current day i like it's not a period piece but like we just watched the great dictator on our show and it's Mm -hmm. like i don't know anything that encapsulates the beginning of the 40s right when world war ii was like catching fire everywhere yeah um, that like works so well as a time capsule of a time period that might be a cheat Um, i'll take it yeah and then let's see the fourth one uh another period piece Let's use the future. Star Wars. There you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, there we go. <laughs> I like that a lot. Or That's, the past. Uh, yes. yes. Not yes. an answer I would have thought of. I That's, love it. Yeah, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. Fair enough. <laughs> Beautiful. Matt, do you have four ready to go? Um, 
I can get there if we need to. I'm debating on my fourth. Just whoever gets there first can. All right. Jump <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and start then. All I, right. uh, with the caveat that, you know, I literally didn't know we were doing this until Matt brought it up. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> off the top of my head and going through this list here, this one actually surprised me that it was on here because I don't think of it as a period piece, but it totally makes sense. But Apollo 13, one of my all time yeah. favorites, uh, a constant rewatch for me. Uh, it looks like the fifties. Uh, so I'll give, you know, or the sixties, not the fifties. Uh, anyways, Apollo 13. Um, and then a personal favorite, which is funny to say, considering I could never remember the name of this movie, but I saw it on this list and it reminded me, but a very long engagement with Audrey mm. tattoo. I don't know if you guys have seen that the same director that did Amelie. Uh, and obviously she's also an Amelie. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's really, really good. It's about a woman who's, uh, partner goes off to war and uh you know they're engaged and it's a very long engagement very good stuff um and then uh i know travis is a fan of this one uh but jojo rabbit i saw on this list and uh Mm -hmm. i think i'm gonna put it there number three and for number four there's a number on this list that i think i could make the art i'm honestly trying to like i'm like there's a couple on here that i've already picked for other uh (laughs) other lists so i don't want to like be you know repeat myself too much um i'm gonna put argo on here it's a movie that we haven't talked about um Uh, on the pod very much at all um i've only seen it once but i really enjoyed it and a lot of fun is is good stuff from our boy ben affleck so yeah i'll throw argo mm, on there why not i think that's awesome that that makes me think of like you know sometimes you come across stuff on twitter that makes you like realize how old you are yeah. And I, I saw something the other day. It's like when we were watching movies in the 90s about the 60s, it's like watching a movie right now about the 90s. And I was just like, oh, oh my God. Like, <laughs> you know, it's that Saving Private Ryan gif of like Matt Damon turning old. Like, yeah. oh, what's happening? But um, if I if I had an honorable mention, it would be mid 90s, a Jonah Hill movie. Oh, because yeah. Because like as someone who grew up in that time frame, like, you know, for the brief moment that I tried to like want to skateboard, you know, with my Ninja Turtles, like skateboard in California, I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, this looks like super familiar. I like this a lot. Like, um, I mean, the movie's great. Movie's a lot of fun, but it just like, it really, you know, the nostalgia really hit me. So I, I would recommend mid nineties too, if you haven't seen that and you are a child of the nineties. What about that was a great one? And maybe this is going to be on someone's list. I guess we're almost done with our list here, but what about like back to the future? We almost get like a number of period pieces inside of a period piece. That's true. I thought about that. And, um, yeah, what's the other one? That thing you do. That one's super fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a lot so, of great ones. It's, this was a kind of a weird list for me because I'm like, I don't Matt, know. You better not use any of those. I want four <laughs> new ones. I'm the, I, I've, been, I've been updating my list as you guys <laughs> say. Uh, okay, let's talk about back to the future. all <laughs> of the period pieces before he can go. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I had one written down, but I love that thing you do more than what I wrote down. So mm. I'm using that thing you do. Nice. Cool. I love that thing you do. The Oneidas. That's the wonders. I so could watch good. that right now and I could watch it again tomorrow morning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Selma. Yeah. It's really nice. awesome. Um, Jojo Rabbit, you know. Mm-hmm. Got brought up earlier today, and Tyler just oh, brought man. it up again. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, I'd I'd written down True Grit as well. Nice, cool. I like it. So and Mitch nuts. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, it's <laughs> nuts. Yeah. Period piece. I mean, yeah. <laughs> hey, Los Angeles, 1995. Yeah. Does is no does No Country for Old Men count as a period piece? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the that, haircut alone. The haircut alone qualifies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. I that one might actually replace Argo because yeah. I like No Country for Old Men's one of my all time favorites. So uh, I'll I'll leave Argo in because I don't know the next time we'll talk about it on the pod. Want to hear a funny story about No Country real quick? More than anything. No Country. Okay, I was in a theater seeing No Country for Old Men on opening weekend. And I'm not going to tell you what time period it is because it will mess up the end of the story. We get to the end of it gets to the end of No Country for Old Men, and you know they they made a specific choice, no music in the whole movie, mm-hmm. right? There's no music in No Country, and then Tommy Lee Jones is saying his last monologue, and he says like this beautiful poetic metaphor of the dream that he had. It represents his father, 
And then it's like, and then he says, and then I woke up and it cuts to credits. And that's the first time you hear, like, I think some kind of music. Yeah. I literally heard someone two rows in front of me go, we should have seen Hitman. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> oh my God. And that's when I knew, like, beautiful. I need to get out of here. <laughs> I love it. That should have been your story for best uh, movie experience. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> you should have about it until you said that No Country was good, which it is. <laughs> yeah. I can't think of the great movie without thinking of that dumb, dumb two rows in front of me. Like, oh, that's great. I that's love funny. it. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, he probably should have seen Hitman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He probably had a horrible time if he yeah. wanted to go see Hitman yeah. instead. <laughs> well, thanks, Travis, for coming on with us. Um, we just wanted to give you one last opportunity to promote your pod real quick. Yes, thank you so much. This was a this was a blast. I feel like I've known you for years somehow. Um <laughs> Mixed nuts, uh, baby. Yeah. Kindred spirits. We'll do that. Nuts. If we the two people in the world they like mix nuts somehow. Then I can't I don't believe know. that happened. We need to yeah. start a mix nuts exclusive podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that. I hope Tyler and I can come on sometime. <laughs> yeah. We do one minute of the movie every week. Oh yeah. Whenever you get to the Sandler song moment, please yeah. have yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, so please check out Let the Movie Speak. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's not all that crazy different from this show. It's laid back, but with a little bit of structure. And uh, me and my buddy Justin do not take ourselves too seriously and hopefully get you interested in something that you might not have seen before. Um, so we're on Twitter, Instagram, and all the things. Um, L- hashtag LTMS pod. I guess I have to say that too, even though I feel like a doofus, but that's part of it. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we'll get all, all that stuff in here too. Do you guys like, can you give people an idea of what's coming up on you guys? Is on, you're on season two now, right? Yeah. Some, some notable ones and some kind of out of left field picks. And we hope the mix is, is better than just going like Casablanca, you know, and everything <laughs> you've heard of, you know, maybe you heard reviewed several times before. So that's hey, what's coming up. One of my favorite movies just got referenced. We can wrap up the pod now. <laughs> hey, all right, we did it. Ferris and Casablanca. <laughs> that. That's it. That's great. <laughs> we it was, did it. It worked. We did it. We can close it now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, for sure. Check check out um, Travis and Let the Movie Speak podcast. You can always find us everywhere that you can find podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, um, Apple, Apple Podcasts. And check us out on our Patreon. We've got some Patreon packages that we put together. We do a lot of fun uh, community movie watch parties. Uh, we try to get as bit. We try to get everyone involved in this movie club as we possibly can. We care about what you think. We want to hear your reviews. We want you to message us. We want to talk about movies with literally everybody. Um, So join the community. uh, Send us a note. You know, we'll we'll respond. Tyler responds to hate mail. So Mm -hmm. love it. Send the hate mail. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time. See ya. Skinny Uncle Harry or a fat and fade. I wonder if you know how good you look in those pantyhose. <laughs> I wonder if you're happy that I didn't mention anything about the things coming out of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so many things for me to wonder.